Today, I'm particularly excited to introduce, to introduce our guest, who is not only an outstanding scholar on Chinese Buddhism, but also my personal teacher and supervisor, um, Dr. Li Yujin. Dr. Li is speaking today on Journeys to the South, Chan Buddhist Records from the Chinese Diaspora. Dr. Yujin Li is professor at the Graduate Institute of Religious Studies and the director of the Center for the Studies of Chinese Religions at Zhengzhou University in Taiwan. She received her PhD in East Asian Literature from Cornell University, specializing in Chinese and Taiwanese Buddhism with particular focus on gender and monasticism. Her monographs include the Bikunis in, Bikunis in the Tang Dynasty, Buddhism and Women in Post-World Taiwan, and Ordinary and Extraordinary Men and Women in Buddhist Literature. She is also the co-editor of Women and Religions, Interdisciplinary Perspectives. And she's working on a six volume series on the history of Taiwanese Buddhism together with a great team of researchers that will be published in 2022. She is the main editor of the volume on, the, on monasteries, monastic founders and lineage in, lineages in Taiwan within this series. And just before we begin, just a few more words on the format of today's event. Dr. Li will give her presentation for about roughly 40 minutes. Then we have 20 minutes for Q&A. The Q&A session will be moderated by Dr. Vivrain Walters, the Institute's graduate affiliate. Please write your questions into the chat during the talk and Vivrain will read them for you after the presentation. So without further ado, please, Eugen, welcome. In Taiwan, we say good morning <laughs> to everyone and thank you for a uh, chance to invite me. I, I didn't realize how how big this uh, research team is, but I I have learned a lot from uh, working with uh, our colleagues. And this work uh, for me is a very, uh, how to say that, very interesting work because uh, we cannot visit Malaysia because of the COVID-19. So it's kind of a lot of memory comes out especially uh, about the Venerable Kai Di. Let's, let's watch my PDF, okay? Here. Okay, now this is my topic. My primary, uh, primary resources is about Nan Yu Yun Shui Qing, Journey to the South from Clouds to Waters, Buddhist luminaries in Singapore and Malaysia uh, from 1888 to 2005, complified by Venerable Kai Di. Uh, last time I met him in Malaysia, it's about like uh, five or six years ago. Uh, he followed a place at Bao Yu Tang, a very famous vegetarian hall uh, in, uh, 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 in, in, in Malaysia. And he, he has been very famous because he has done so many works to correct materials of Malaysia Buddhism. And after uh, published three volumes of this, uh, Malaysia history, Buddhist history, he kind of complained. Uh, the research on this book are not uh, so, so much. So he decided to, to, to do his PhD. Now he's in Singapore in search for his own PhD degree. Okay, so <laughs> let's see what he have done. This is uh, the first button. Okay, I will uh, research only the uh, first two volumes because I focus on monastic organization and uh, and the key figures. As for the third volumes, there are a lot of uh, materials, um, pictures, um, data, um, material. Uh, they will be my next step to 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 do research. Uh, my talk will only focus many focus on nun and monks. This is the first balloon, and this is the second balloon. You can see the same structures, okay? And why Zen, why Chan records 
uh, because uh, the title include the two uh, two words, yun shui. Okay, yun shui has two metaphors. The first one is uh, people meeting like clouds and rain, an unconscious, uh, serendipitous meeting. And also yun shui is part of Chan monastic training when monks uh, uh, when monks uh, stayed at their own monasteries for uh, a period of time, they need to leave their monasteries and visit other Chan masters in search of recognition as the enlightened. Uh, in other words, to become a recognized Dharma heir. So it doesn't matter uh, you become the Dharma heir of your own monastery or not. The, key point is to become the Dharma heir of the lineage, the Dharma lineage of Chan, okay? And, and we can see uh, uh, Kai Di, Master Kai Di tells a story about the complicated transformation of Chinese Buddhism in Southeast Asia. And in this way, he, he collects uh, those memories of uh, his colleague or uh, from his teachers. He is not talking, he's not only talking about a story of the past. In doing so, he is creating the, the history of uh, Malaysia Buddhism. And he is very uh, aware of this. So uh, as a um, the first part of the book, he, he talked about Malaysia Chinese Buddhism as an often shot of Buddhism from Fujian and Guangdong provinces in later imperial China, and continued to develop with the introduction of Taiwanese and American Chinese Buddhism during the 1990s. So uh, I think at this point, Malaysia Buddhism is transforming from uh, the offspring, from the, uh, my, the migrant Buddhism from China to part of the international world. So uh, these books are very important. Okay, and before I continue my talk, I will introduce an idea about Chinese diaspora. Okay, uh, when we talk about a Chinese diaspora, uh, we talk about the kind of relation between the hometown or uh, the migrated areas. And in the past, we used to use Yuanxiang, Yuanxiang, the Chinese homeland to describe the area you move out. And also uh, we will address your hometown as Qiaoxiang, literally the home village of overseas Chinese immigrants. And Chinese scholarship uh, stopped to use Qiaoxiang recently, okay? And uh, because Chinese Buddhism, Chinese Buddhists also want to become part of an international platform. And another uh, reason is uh, uh, the later period of Qing Dynasty, the economic the, the mon, uh, monastic finance has been ruined by the rebellion of Taiping Tianguo. Taiping Tianguo uh, occupied the, the area centered in Nanjing, today's Nanjing uh, city, and they destroyed a lot of Chinese monastery. It forced a certain amount of Chinese monastery in Fujian, Guangdong, have to look for support from Chinese migrants. And this is very a uh, critical situation. And I will mention the why you can see so many important, uh, so many famous the Chinese Chan monastery was sent their alright to Malaysia and Singapore to, to do fundraising. Or you, if you want to become uh, the next uh, Arvind, you have to prove yourself by visiting Malaysia and collect money. 
collect support. So the, the, the relationship between Qiaoxiang, between Hong Kong and the Malaysia is very uh, important, very critical for most uh, 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 monasteries during the time. Okay. And as Xie uh, Mingda has pointed out, previous research uh, really mentioned about uh, the uh, Dharma diaspora. Okay, but now we understand uh, uh, migrants and migrants and the moving monk, missionary Chinese monk, they have played important roles uh, for the spread of Buddhism. Okay, and and when we uh, and also other scholars already pointed out uh, uh, the beliefs of Ch uh, Chinese mi migrants, those temples they built in the new territory is very critical because it's not only uh, keep their uh, relation with hometown, also, also establish their new identity in the new area. Okay, so we can see uh, how uh, Chinese Buddhism, how these um, monks, missionary monks, uh, join this great journey. And today we will focus on two provinces in, Thai, uh, in China, is Fujian and Guangdong. Uh, basically, uh, I, I did some investigation. Uh, these Chinese monks, they visit uh, Southeast Asia uh, from a lot of uh, different areas, including uh, like more than, uh, more than half provinces. Uh, I think because uh, if you want to uh, conduct a pilgrimage in India, you need to go like go through Malaysia. That's why so many uh, Chinese monks from different provinces have stopped by Malaysia. But for women, for nuns, it's very interesting. Uh, most Malaysia nuns, they came from Guangdong provinces. There's a huge difference, okay. And from the monastic perspective, they were describing this kind of spreading as the spread of Dharma lineage, the transmission of Dharma lineage. They, they, these monks and nuns, they will help uh, Chinese migrant in different kind of Chinatown, uh, in different kind of uh, uh, folk religious temples. But their goal is to establish their own overseas branch. And also they have a conducted uh, ordination. Only have a order, uh, order, ordination ceremony means your lineage has been introduced to this new area. And whenever, whenever the new temples, overseas new temple can also conduct ordination ceremony means a new center is established. So we can see how Buddhism uh, developed into a, a, a lot of uh, centers connected. Uh, this kind of networking through ordination, through the relation between master and disciples. So from monastic perspective, Kai Di's work uh, is, is, is very important. Okay, is a kind of trans regional Buddhist expression. Okay, by focus on the Dharma lineage. And from, uh, and we can see, uh, this is the, the, the theme, the main theme. Kai Di, Menomo Kai Di organized his book according these four main themes. Okay, the first thing we just mentioned, the Dharma lineage, transformation of the Dharma lineage. And, and we can see uh, in this part, you can see the ancestral temple, ancestral uh, monasteries in China and the new overseas branch. And sometimes even have a new offspring temples. 
when the lineage has created the second, the third generation, they have a rooted their own lineage in new territory. So this kind of zi sun miao, offspring temples uh, start to, to uh, emerge. And the second part is the biographies of monks that traveled from China to Malaysia and Singapore. Okay, uh, actually, uh, not uh, when I say traveled means for the first and the second generation of missionary monks, they came there for fundraising and they still want to go back to China to, to that in, in China, Luoshu Guigen. Okay. And some Chinese monk, they, they came to uh, Malaysia for advanced, uh, for their journey to the India. And some monk, especially famous monk, uh, were forced to run, run out China because of the, because of war, okay? And also we have a lot of, uh, not a lot, uh, we have also, also have a, a Taiwanese monks, they represented the Japanese colonial government to visit these areas. You can see uh, when the uh, Buddhist modernization movement goes on, and we have a uh, lot of uh, educated learned monks from China, from Taiwan, uh, came to Malaysia. Uh, I think the, the, the role, uh, Taiwanese monks played are uh, very interesting. They also represent the, the benefit of Japanese colonial government, but they are benefited by their languages. They also speak the same language uh, uh, as the uh, Chinese mig migrants in Malaysia. Okay. And the third part is the spread of Buddhism. Okay. Because when you uh, describe uh, how many uh, foreign monk or Chinese monk came to uh, Malaysia and established their own uh, network. Uh, it also shows the history of Malaysia in the past two centuries. And the first item, other, is very interesting because there are a small amount of Chinese nuns. Okay. And from the uh, gender uh, perspective, we can see during the process of Buddhist migration, monks and nuns play quite different roles. And we, we need to, to pay attention to the female, ma, uh, female immigrants in this area. They, most of them come from Guangdong, Guangdong provinces. They can, came here as uh, labor, working laborers. So uh, uh, we will mention like uh, Zai Gu, the vegetarian women, or a lot of different kind of lay nuns, lay nuns, okay? They, they didn't receive uh, uh, very well Buddhist education. They practice uh, uh, some, something very easily like, uh, name Buddhist, like chanting the Buddha's name but they are rich, they are very rich because they don't marry, they work very hard. And when they age it, they have no their own families, but they got, get a lot of money. Uh, so these women uh, played a very uh, strong support for monks. Okay, we, we need to pay attention to these kind of situations. Okay. And this is the structure uh, of two, the first two balance. Okay. The first thing we can see, uh, okay, is the lineage. Okay. And the second part talk about the biographies. And the third part, recollection of the older photos. Uh, because uh, Venerable Kaidi didn't, didn't mark all names. He couldn't recognize all names of those figures on pictures. So sometimes uh, it, each picture means a beginning of a new story. So if you want to go ahead, we, we can follow it, okay? And in order to collect these 
information, this data, Kaidi have joined a lot of funerals of monks. Uh, it's a kind of tradition monks or nuns will burn their own certificate, like a certificate of tonsure, certificate of ordination, because they believe they can keep their own identity, the monastic identity in the other world. It's very important. So they, they won't show their personal uh, papers and they will burn these papers at their funerals. So Kaidi has to, has to join a lot of funerals to take pictures and sometimes uh, even to find out uh, how the elder monks and nuns uh, hide, where they hide these papers and explain what this is. Okay, so uh, this book is very interesting. If you want to conduct certain uh, material research of Sangha expression, uh, the book, especially the third volume, will be very useful. Okay, let's talk about uh, the lineage. Uh, basically, uh, Kaidi pointed out the lineage, especially Chan lineage, came from these five uh, headquarters. The Guanghua Si, Fu Qing Si, Si Shou Si, Guang Xiao Si, and the Yong Quan Si. Okay, and it's it's very important to point out Yong Quan Si because uh, Yong Quan Si also developed their uh, network in Taiwan. Uh, there are more than uh, four four hundred monks and nuns belong to the same lineage originated from Yong Quan Si. So. After uh, World War II, when a uh, Malaysian monk and nun cannot go back to, Thai, uh, to China, they are stopped by the Cultural Revolution. Then they, knew, they built up uh, a new uh, network with Taiwanese monks because a lot of Taiwanese monks came from the same area, uh, especially with the same Dharma lineage from Yong Quan Si. Okay, so uh, from this research, I can see the headquarters of uh, Dharma Center could be shipped. Okay, we can have a, uh, a new alley, but the critical point is we need come from the same lineage in China. Okay. And as we can see here, they will take a lot of uh, pictures of the headquarters and also the overseas branches. And this is the Jile Si, the Kelo Si in Penang. This is the most important uh, overseas center of uh, Chinese Buddhism. Okay. And also they have to preserve a lot of uh, pictures of their Chinese headquarters. Like this is the uh, Yong Quan Si, as I mentioned, it's very important uh, to Malaysian monks and to some uh, Taiwanese monks. And this is uh, Xi Chang Si, another uh, important center. Okay, uh, that's what I mentioned, the headquarters in Buddhist terms, it will become the home temple or ancestral temples. And we can see uh, earlier Malaysia Buddhist monasteries affiliate with their home temples as overseas branch called the Xia Yue. Xia Yue actually is like a, an office in the beginning. Okay. And because uh, when they first arrived there, they have to, these monks have to, to, to uh, live at uh, folk religious temples. Most of them are temples built by Fujian and Guangdong migrants and worship many Guan Yin Pusa, the goddess of mercy. And after they collect, after they establish enough uh, network, get enough support, these monks will build their own temples, their own monasteries uh, for their uh, practicing meditation, for their retreat life, you know, this kind of temple will be called a more pure Buddhist style. It's kind of Sangha centered. Okay. 
And also we can see uh, from overseas branch like the killer seed and become offspring of uh, temples, Zisun Miao, like uh, the Longshan Si in, uh, in Singapore. Uh, and these offspring temples are not very uh, stable because uh, local community, they will like change, uh, change their uh, country with different uh, Chinese temples. So you can see uh, if you go to the ancestral hall at least uh, uh, offspring temples, you can see layers. Okay, they can even change. When, when you got uh, enough support, you, you can have all these temples and the uh, original owner, original lineage, they will uh, work out to build their new off, offspring temples. Just like the Chinese family, there are so many clients, so many lines existed. So the offspring temples become more and more and become smaller and smaller. This is a very unique situation uh, in, in Malaysia too. Okay. And for Taiwan, Hong Kong, and the United States, uh, Kaidi also feels threatened by the new wave of uh, Asian Buddhism. Okay. Uh, they have uh, uh, many uh, famous monks from Taiwan, Hong Kong, and the United States. Okay. Uh, I, I think we know about the uh, Inshun. Know about Fu Guangshan Dharma L and also the Amidama Buddhist Association. This is uh, I call the most popular practice of Chinese Buddhists. It's the chanting of Buddha's name. Okay, and also there are kind another group of Taiwanese monk. Okay, uh, most Taiwanese monk leaders are from China, like Venerable Bai Sheng. He's the head of the Chinese uh, the Association of Chinese Buddhism. In Taiwan, he is very important. And he inherited the same Dharma lineage of Yong Quan Si. Okay, so he even spent uh, nine years to take the position of abbot of Kelosi. So he became uh, the head of Kelosi and the head of Shi Pu Si in Taipei at the same time. Okay, even today, uh, the Kelosi still have a uh, uh, Baishan's disciples uh, to, to run, to help them to run the temples. This is another group of people. And the third group of people is from uh, American, it's from the Wan Fu Cheng, Xuan Hua Fa Shi, Wan Fu Cheng, also spread from San Francisco to Malaysia. And it's very interesting to find out nuns has played a very important role in introducing these new organizations to enter uh, Malaysia. Because these Buddhist organizations, they are not just international, institutionalized. They all have, their, they all establish their own Buddhist academy. And Malaysia nuns go to these Buddhist academy to earn their uh, education, education. Also, they will join the Dhamma lineage of these groups. Okay, so when they came back, they were introducing these new Buddhist organization. They become the uh, pioneer. They become the first generations of uh, first generation uh, first generations of these groups uh, in Malaysia. And Wan Fu Cheng, I need to mention, their support uh, came from, not only from young nuns, but from old vegetarian women. Okay, all the vegetarian women, uh, they couldn't attract more young women to join them. So they kind of transfer their identity. If they don't want to transfer their ident identity to become Buddhist nuns, they, they, they will uh, support their own, uh, their own leaders. They, they, took, they used to take a refugee or Buddhist monks instead of to receive ordination from these monks. And 
one fortune is kind of different. They support many from vegetarian women. Okay, all women behind the screen. Okay, and in comparison, these two ways of uh, Dharma migrations uh, have reserved a great uh, similarity. Okay, they, 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 they have a, this kind of relation between headquarters and overseas branches, but they share the same lineage, the same ideal monasticism. And in this process, uh, uh, the spread of Buddhism become more and more international. Okay. And when every, every time when the new Buddhist organization joined Malaysia, the Buddhist circle will start to, to like a competition combine and then a new community identity will be produced. Okay. And Kai Di is aware of this, this situation. Okay. And that, that shows this important thing. This is the ordination certificate. Okay, this is uh, the Tan Shou. Okay. And you can see uh, that's what I, I just mentioned. Monks and nuns usually will burn burn this at their desk. Okay. And now uh, let's talk about the immigrant uh, process. Okay. Uh, there are three stages. Basically, uh, Chinese migrants, they will build a guide hall and also accommodate their local deities. And these local deities function as ancestral gods. And when the more and more uh, Chinese migrants melt into the same area, they don't say, oh, you are from Hakka, you are from Guangdong. Anyway, they work together. So they create a, a, a special type of temple called Guang Fu Gong, Guang Fu Gong, the temple built by the Cantonese and the Hokkanese. Guang Fu Gong, you can see from Malaysia to Singapore. A lot of these kind of temples appeared and they become the uh, worship uh, the deity, the deity become local protection deities. This is the second stage. And the third stage, uh, uh, the, the worship of this uh, deity and also uh, uh, the, this kind of temple uh, become uh, cultural symbols. Okay, so these are the three stage development of folk religions. How about how about the Buddhism? And we can see Chinese monk, they also joined these procedures by taking the position of Ava of different kinds of temples. Okay. They, they couldn't become the uh, real monk, became the, the holder of guide uh, hall. Okay. But they will take care of certain ancestral gods, like uh, this Qing Shui Yan Zhu Miao in Penna. This is a Hakka people's, their special uh, worship god. They, they will join uh, the community to run this kind of ancestral temples. Also, they will uh, become the important uh, uh, administration team of local temples like a Qing Yun Ting, Ma Liu Jia Qing Yun Ting. And we can see uh, in spite of this male, uh, this monastic advice ship, the worship of Guan Yin play a critical role. Guan Yin is, well, some people will say, oh, this is Buddhist goddess. And some Taoists say, no, 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 it belongs to Taoists. Anyway, Guan Yin bridge a lot of uh, religious groups together. Okay, so Buddhism, they also join these three stages. And the other thing, let's take about, uh, uh, the, this is an own monastic system, okay? We can see the Fa Juan, the certification of receiving Dharma. That's what I just mentioned, Yun Shui. The goal of Yun Shui is to become a, uh, 
Dalma Air, and then you got the Fa Jun, the certificate. And also you have a, your own ordination certificate, these kind of things. And Kaidi, Minimal Kaidi collected 14 Dharma scrolls and 13 ordination certificates in his book. I, I think the Dharma score, 14 Dharma score, this means a lot because in the past, one lineage only produced one Dharma air. Okay. Uh, Today, uh, a lot of um, a lot of monks they will they will deliver their monastic certificate uh, very generously. One monk got the more than one hundred dharma l, but in the past there's only one dharma l of in one generations. So you can see from the fourteen dharma scores, you can see how many Chinese monk were sent to Malaysia. Okay, and they have worked very hard to establish, the, to, to root it, their own Chinese lineage into the new territories. Okay, so this is the past and the future of Malaysia Buddhism. Okay, and I, I divided uh, uh, Malaysia's history into three eras, and I calculate uh, those monks, uh, their Dharma lineage, their birthplace, their, the, the place of their birth and death, and the time and the place of their ordinations, and also uh, the area, the, mission, uh, the, the location of the missionary. I have uh, done a lot of calculations, and the result didn't uh, too much. I, I, I'm not sure how to show it. I just got a, a, a conclusion that I will introduce uh, to you. Okay. These are loads of pictures we can see. They have special chapters. Okay. And Kai Di, his, his, his design of this book is to get Malaysia Buddhism into the, into the, the map of Chinese Buddhism. It's very important for Kai Di. Okay. Uh, Kai Di, uh, he followed a very traditional style to edit uh, his data, okay? Uh, like the Dharma name and also their uh, background and the, the, the reason why they become monks to enter the orders and location of missionary work and uh, a lot of things, okay? And moreover, okay, uh, of course, Singapore, uh, as a country appear later than Malaysia, okay? But we can see uh, most missionary uh, monks, they will visit uh, Malaysia according to the, the, the uh, language, okay? Hakka people will go to Ibao and uh, Pilibao, no. You, you were like invited by your uh, villagers, they migrated to uh, Malaysia, they need someone you can communicate easily. Okay, so you can keep all this, a lot of uh, temples built in Malaysia. Then some, some uh, monks, they will move to Singapore to establish their own offsprings. Because in the beginning, Singapore is, you know, means a new uh, territory. The, the history of Singapore is shorter. Okay, Malaysia, like a panel, like uh, Ibao, other places, they have a long history, more than 100 years of, Saint, of, of Buddh Buddhist temples. So uh, Singapore become a new uh, territory for these uh, Chinese missionary works. Okay, and moreover, we can see, uh, okay, so, also, there is this a relation between Malaysia and Singapore, uh, monks and nuns. Uh, we have the first Buddhist academy in Penang. And then their disciples were invited to Singapore to build the uh, Buddhist academy in Singapore. Okay. So you can see uh, the, the, the trail of development. All this from uh, Kaidi's book. 
And this is first generations. Only four monks have a, uh, only four months. We found the, uh, only the record of four months. And they are all very high ranking monks. And they all went back after they finished their missionary work. They didn't stay at, uh, stay at their uh, overseas office. They all went back except uh, one monk, uh, Hita Eru. I think he was uh, in a critical situation, make him couldn't go back to have a wonderful bath in China. That's the reason. And their uh, attendance disciples are also from China. Okay, but they, I, I don't understand the why, but maybe because their responsibility or their affiliation with local communities uh, help them to settle down in a new area. So the attendance disciples of these four monks as the second generations, they stayed in Malaysia, they died in Malaysia. As for the third generation of these monks, okay, they keep on send uh, disciples from the headquarters, Chinese headquarters. And also they, they have a, a new disciples from local people, but very rare. Very real, very interesting. Most Chinese, uh, most uh, monks in, most of the monks in Malaysia are, are migrants from China to, to Malaysia. This is situation continued until 1970 or something. Very interesting, very different from Nang's situation. And we can see the hometowns the division, I, I did a, a, a calculation here. Fujian, Jiangxi, Zhejiang. Most are uh, monks from Xiamen and Quanzhou. Okay. And this is the second generation. I need to mention Jue Li, who established a new lineage in Taiwan. Okay. Ben Yuan Shanghui. They are all Taiwanese monks and represented the Japanese government to visit uh, Malaysia. And also Tai Xu, Yuan Ying, Xu Yun, Han. These are all famous uh, revolutionary monks during at the later time. Okay, so you can see uh, all of them were concerned with the modernization movements of Chinese Buddh Buddhism. And they keep on visiting Malaysia. So you can see the potential of the Malaysia Buddhist. Okay. And third generations, basically, Kilo uh, uh, well, it was well uh, established during these times. Okay. And also lay Buddhist. For well, lay Buddhists, they also uh, they were also introduced into uh, Malaysia. Uh, even today. Uh, the Buddhist population, uh, they, they don't have uh, enough monks and enough uh, nuns. Okay, and and uh, the, the ratio of monks to nuns is one to four. There are more nuns than monks in Malaysia. Okay, the situation is very familiar with Taiwan. Okay. But uh, leadership, religious leadership is still on the hand of monks, okay? Especially you have a, uh, those monks has a close relationship with Chinese headquarters. Okay, these are other calculations, okay. And we can see uh, this monk, Yuan Zhang, was the first Malaysian monk to go to Taiwan for ordination. Okay, uh, the key person is Bai Shen. Uh, it started from 1974, okay. Uh, and, uh, on the one hand, we have uh, the key to hold ordination by themselves. On the other hand, a lot of uh, Malaysian monks and nuns visit Taiwan to receive ordination 
to join uh, their uh, organization, international organization to become students of Buddhist academia in all happened in 1970s. Okay. And the first Buddhist academy built in Penang for monks and nuns is the uh, Malaysia for Xue Yuan, Malaysia Academic. It, it is established in 1970, very late, 1970, very late. Okay. But uh, vegetarian women and the nuns already built a Buddhist academy for women, Pu Ti Xue Yuan, in 1977, 1930, uh, 1937. Okay, so they are kind of two wars. Okay. And to make sure, uh, how, how about the motive? motivation of these missionary monks, okay? We, we can see they, like uh, they are forced to come to flee and they have a their uh, religious commitment, okay? And genealogy transmitted uh, through ordination offers the most Operatable channel of Buddhist propagation to build, to expand your Dharma lineage overseas. That's become the most normal reason to support, to, to help them to leave the country. Okay. And then we see the uh, Kilo C, I mentioned very uh, many times. Okay. Here, just what I mentioned, you have a different uh, group, different uh, uh, ordination ceremony to join. Okay, it means uh, loads lineages, Dharma lineage in Malaysia has expanded international. Okay, and about the nuns, let, now let's talk about the monk, nuns. The first nuns, according to Venerable Kaidi, is Fang Lian. Okay. He came to Malaysia as a Buddhist nun. He received her ordination in Beijing. Okay. But she has a, a, a great group of female followers. Lots of disciples, most of them are vegetarian women. Okay. And Fang Lian, as a nun, did not force these women to have their hair cut to become nuns. It's very interesting things. And also, women from this body academy were highly regarded by the Chinese elite of Malaysia as brides and the daughters-in-law. Because in 1930s, real women had a chance to receive education. And Fang Lian collected a group of women to build up free education for women. This is very interesting thing. Of course, they are in the names of religious education, but behind the whole, whole theme, you can see these vegetarian women, they came from very rich, elite local families. It means before the uh, Sangha, before the uh, monastic, uh, monasteries has been introduced to, to these areas. A lot of families, a clan, they are Buddhist, but they practice their own style of, Buddhist, of Buddhism, like folk Buddhism or like vegetarian Buddhism, this kind of thing, very confused. But they're women without hair, uh, we we love the tonsures, okay. Can do a lot of things. They all become a very important uh, female leaders in Malaysia, okay. Religious resources, educational res resources, and of course a lot of profit behind that. So we have a very interesting group of uh, Malaysia nuns in the first and second generations. 
Okay, this is called the Jaigu vegetarian women. Okay, and we can see uh, the uh, venerable Fang Fang Lian. Okay, their disciples, they they may be uh her disciples of the teachers of the school, they will keep their hair, do their uh, social work, do their live their secular life, and until the old age, they decided to become Buddhist nuns. Okay, they change their identity very late. Okay, for example, like uh, these two important person, Quan Zhong. Okay, you can see this is kind of style vegetarian women transform their identity into Buddhist nuns gradually. But Kai Di did not address these women as vegetarian women. They, she, she, he called them the cultivation with hair. And Shi Bu means they are lay Buddhist. Okay, so Heidi is kind of, you no, know, he is still a uh, very uh, Sangha or Sangha century. This is his monastic perspective. Okay. And I check uh, where, uh, uh, how many Chinese nuns came to Malaysia. And this part of calculation is very difficult. I have to uh, develop this group according, the, according to their time of death because real records has been kept. Women's uh, records are already ignored. Okay, so I, 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 I use the same standard like uh, a lot for, for those uh, Chinese monks, but I can only calculate a uh, nuns trace by the time of the death. Okay, so uh, I need to do more uh, field work. Okay. And th this is the reason why we can, couldn't see enough number of Zai Tang or in number uh, into that, enough introduction of Jai Gu, okay. But Jai Gu was everywhere. They can uh, run, they can help or even establish their own temples in different areas. And then from the, uh, this is other uh, ordination we can see Chinese monk very uh, active throughout uh, this region. Okay, but Buddhist uh, non community uh, basically developed after 1970s. Okay, I think education is a very important factor because uh, those famous nuns, they all well known by promote education and including their own educational background. And since Malaysia has their own Buddhist academy, a lot of women, including vegetarian women, they change their identity in order to receive more Buddhist educations. So 1970 will be a very uh, turning point, okay? And if you don't want to uh, receive uh, ordination in Malaysia, after 1970, don't forget that you have other choice. You can go to Taiwan. <laughs> so you, you see uh, two groups approaching to each other. Okay. Uh, but I, I have to emphasize Kai Di's perspective. Only uh, nuns have a chance to receive ordination then their lineage has been established. So a community has been established. Okay. This is the phenomena happened in Malaysia. Okay, my conclusion, the first thing is we can see uh, Kai Di 
uh, unconsciously or consciously to establish the uh, subjectability of Manasya Buddhism. And his way is to, to tie, to emphasize the Chinese origin to legitimize the development of Malaysia Buddhism. Okay, but this, this, this history has been interrupted by what happened in China. And Taiwan as their sibling, Dharma siblings, replaced the position of Chinese headquarters. So they become to help each other, okay? Of course, the situation has been changed a little bit because now China is open. Okay, so more and more Chinese, long, Chinese monks went back to Malaysia. Okay, and we can see uh, individual Taiwanese monks and nuns will play the role of Dharma teacher in Malaysia. And when many Ch Chinese monks, they came to Malaysia to only to perform rituals, ritual service during the uh, lunar seven months. Okay, so they still cooperate with each other, but the different part of the Buddhist life. It's very interesting. So education, okay. And the second uh, conclusion I got is this. Why uh, the monasticism, not uh, like uh, Kilosi, suddenly receive a lot of support. Not, uh, it, not only monks decided, there is a very important change. Uh, after uh, the Qing dynasty disappeared, okay, declined, and the Chinese diaspora uh, business community has been changed. In the past, uh, rich Malaysia Chinese, they can purchase title, normal status from Qing government. But since Qing government disappeared, so they turn to support certain cultural activities, including to build a temple, to build a wood academy in mainland China. This has become a cultural capital. And that's why these more pure monastic uh, organization has received a lot of support. So uh, these Chinese monk, they move from the Guangfu Gong that I just mentioned in Chinatown and to have their own monasteries. Okay, this is a change. Okay, the, the third thing, as we can see, is uh, the birthplace and lineage. Okay, so most uh, Malaysia monks are from China, but most Malaysia nuns they are from vegetarian halls. They are female migrants, but they don't have a temple headquarter in, in, in mainland China. So that if they want to support themselves, if they cannot build their own education organization, they have to perform rituals. So even today, uh, vegetarian women in Malaysia are very, very good uh, ritual performers. They collect from different temples, different lineages. Anything you, you want, anything new, anything uh, you know, uh, uh, popular, they will join it. So vegetarian women, they still have their, uh, their finance support, okay. And we can see uh, Chinese Buddhism set a standard of an ideal Buddhism in the minds of Malaysia. Malaysia monastic. The idea of the idea of Buddhism is still uh, rooted in China. Okay, and if you want to color, uh, want to claim your le uh, legitimacy, you you have to rebuild the relationship with the Chinese ancestral home. There's a movement that go back to visit your Zhu Ting in mainland China, your ancestral home, your uh, headquarters in, in China. That's, uh, that's what they are doing. But in the same ways, uh, more and more uh, 
Buddhist organization has been very international. They spread to Australia, to American, just like the uh, migrants movement. Okay, so Malaysia Buddhism become a very, uh, how to say, very international. A new community appeared. Okay, they, they even have their own overseas branches now. So we can see also there's a great disparity between the number of monks and nuns. And if one if want to uh, interpret uh, the development of Buddhism in certain area, you can see from women's perspective, you, you can see a different pictures, very different pictures. Uh, I think it's, it's very, uh, Acceptable because usually missionary work conducted by men more than women. Okay, so uh, and women they don't have enough connection with uh, sangha. Women can practice uh, very easily at home, like uh, chanting the Dhamma's name, take a vegetarian diet, these kind of things. This kind of folk folk uh, Buddhist forms produce a lot of lay nuns, like vegetarian women. And when a monastic member came, how they connect with each other. It's a very interesting you know, activities and, and slowly, slowly, those vegetarian women will change their identity. Okay. So this is all my talk. Uh, I think I will stop here. <laughs> Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Yi Jin. It was really a fascinating and very rich um, presentation. And we already have very interesting questions in the chat room. So I'll just give over to Riverain. Hand it okay, over to Riverain. Thank you. Okay, so um, we have a few questions and we'll just go oh, no. from there. Uh, <laughs> A little bit late, so we'll just try to get through these these few if we can. The first one is: Was it possible to trace lineage to a monastery rather than to a teacher? I, I very good questions. Yeah, of course, because uh, the according to the Dharma name, the transmission of Dharma or set out the name, the first words of the Dharma name. So uh, monks will identify each other by your Dharma name. They don't need to know your, who, who your master is, but from your Dharma name, they can see, oh, okay, you belong to which lineages, which generations. Okay. Kind of close, right? <laughs> Of course, if you can have your own certificate from your master, it will be better. Okay. How about Great, thank second? you. How second about... question is, could you please elaborate about not colonized by Taiwanese Buddhism? What is the distinguished points between Malaysian Buddhism and that of Taiwan? Okay, uh, we have a, a migrate, uh, migrate society in Malaysia. And from Kaidi's records, you can see uh, Malaysia's uh, monastic history only like 200 years. But in Taiwan, we have about like 300 years. And, and and so the development in two areas are kind of different. Okay. Uh, for example, Taiwan belongs to the Qing Empire. Okay. So uh, Qing Empire will build up uh, official monastery in Taiwan. But in Malaysia, they don't have they don't have this kind of support. All uh, monastery are built by are private, they are not official temples, but we have official temples in Taiwan. Okay, this is the first difference. The second difference is uh, Buddhism in Malaysia is a kind of minority people's religion. Okay, 
but in Taiwan, especially after uh, what was since the Chinese, uh, since the Japanese colonizations, the official, or sometimes even the most recognized official religion is Buddhism. So this make you know the development of uh, Buddhism, you know, are different. One is minorities Buddhism. The other is the most important official religion. Sometimes Japanese uh, Buddhism monk even compete with the colonial government. They want to, uh, you know, they, they want more and more Taiwanese become Buddhism. But the Japanese government want more and more people, more Taiwanese to become canons, <coughs> fathers, shrine, the Shinto. So, so the, the situation, the uh, religious environment has been very different. Okay, but international internationalization, Taiwanese Buddhism came to Malaysia. <laughs> okay, and introduced them a new type of monasticism, a new type of lineage. Okay, that's my answer my observation. So even uh, my grand, uh, my grand Dharma would develop into different, you know, different communities. But they are all linked by the same lineage, Dharma lineage. Thank you. Okay, so we have a couple more questions. We're gonna have to stop after that last one that came in. Um, but we're, we're gonna get through these these ones that were posted in the chat. Thanks. Um, okay, so uh, oh, there's three more. Yeah. While many Zangu came from prominent families, there were also orphans, widows, and those who refused to marry, who sought refuge in the many vegetarian halls. Could you say something about this relatively marginalized community and their history? and legacy in the Malaysian Buddhist landscape. Okay, uh, I just mentioned uh, some successful, successful cases by the, these rich, uh, rich vegetarian nuns, okay, vegetarian women. And most uh, Buddhist nuns or vegetarian women, they like uh, earn their life by saving uh, vegetarian food. Okay, by per offering a uh, richer service. Okay, uh, because they are illiterate, they can uh, support themselves by, by labor. So what I mentioned are very important uh, figures. They belong to the elite, <laughs> elite uh, uh, social class. Okay, <clears throat> for example, the same situation happened in Taiwan. Rich family, they were even they were adopt orphanage to become nuns. Okay, but these Taiwanese nuns also kept their hair, so they can regret. They can marry out. They they refuse to become nun after they grown up. They married out, but their temples, their adopt family have to treat them as daughters, so they have to pay pay money. To marry them out, and and these nuns have a high, uh, very high education. You know, during uh, let's think about one hundred fifty years ago, these nuns can even study abroad, go to Hong Kong, go to Taiwan, even go to England to study advanced, go to Japan. So they are very elite. For other part of the vegetarian women, uh. We don't have a much data about them. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, two more questions. Uh, this one is uh, a very interesting one. I was wondering about this myself, about this Jagu again. I wonder if you know about what sort of precepts they may have taken. Five precepts or maybe Bodhisattva precepts. And if they took five, did they follow the path recommended by Hong Yi, 
in which he encouraged a Mahayana version of the five precepts. Thus, as a kind of bodhisattva precepts limited to those five core precepts. I, I, I think uh, this is a very important question uh, for vegetarian women, right? For general Buddhist women, okay? Yes, they do take uh, the five precepts or, and uh, sometimes including the bodhisattva precepts, okay? Uh, this kind of lay precept you can receive at informal occasion. Okay, so you need them to join the huge ordination ceremony to receive three kind of different precepts step by step. If you want to take a refugee from a uh, monk, you can receive these two kind of lay precepts from him very easily. Okay, so I think uh, most uh, Buddhist women can afford to take lay precepts. But for vegetarian women, they are lay nuns. They live at the vegetarian together. You know, they are celibate. They have a, a, a vegetarian diet. They are they living just like nuns. Okay, so they have a they are, uh, Buddhist uh, they, they took a refugee from monks, but they don't recognize themselves as lay people. That's the point. They, you know, they, they, they establish, they, they build themselves as nuns, even better nuns. Then those nuns live at the monastery, uh, monastery relies on people's offering. And Hong Yi Dasu already recognized these situations. So in Xiamen, Hong Yi Da Shi created a very special name for this group of women, Qing Xin Nu, Qing Xin Nu. They are better lay women. Okay, better lay women, better than nuns. Hong Yi Da Shi didn't explain, but he accept this group of women and give them a very, very huge formal or the nation ceremony. They are not the nuns, they are better lay women. And the ceremony held in Xiamen is cooperated by Hong Yi and another uh, uh, monks in Xiamen who has been visited Malaysia. Okay. Okay, I will read the next question because there's some Chinese involved and <laughs> we're going to ask you to, to jump in. <laughs> uh, let me just open the chat box. <clears throat> okay, the next question is, Hi, Xue Jie. Thank you for the fascinating talk. I have two questions. Do you see Kai Di's, oh, my eyes. <laughs> um, as a modern form of Gao Xiang Zhuan, what do you think is the main difference between um, the Nanyo Uso Qing and Gao Xiang Zhuan, other than the inclusion of eminent nuns and Zai Gu, Nanyo Uso Qing, yeah, yeah, I is think a very innovative source to understand the connected I, history I, I, of the <laughs> community. <laughs> Sorry, yes. <laughs> okay, I agree. Uh, Nanyo Uso Qing is a modern version of Gao Xiang Zhuan. Yes. I agree with it. And as part of uh, the biography of nuns, it's like a Bichoni Zhuan. Because of lack of data, so they have to organize these data in, you know, in different ways. So there are a lot of pictures of nuns, but not enough biography records of these nuns. So Kaidi just in, introduced uh, vegetarian nuns uh, in a, you know, just some impression. This, this uh, uh, narrative very briefly. And that's why we have uh, the separation of Gao Sun Zhuan and Bi Chongning Zhuan. And Bi Chongning Zhuan, we can see only one bottom. <laughs> yeah. But uh, Su, Su Yun Ruo and uh, Su Rui Hua, uh, the, the graduate student from the National Singapore University, they have uh, two. Uh, very outstanding students uh, work on vegetarian women. But their way is very interesting. They take it for granted. They treat these vegetarian women as lay Buddhist women. 
Okay, so there are still a quarrel because I know many uh, Taiwanese vegetarian women, they don't recognize themselves as monistic members, but they recognize themselves as better, pure Dharma air. Okay, so, so the, the, this is still an uh, ongoing debate. Oh, okay, thank you so much, Yujin, for this talk today. It was really, really interesting, really exciting. And thanks, of course, to everyone in the audience for showing up today for our fourth lecture in our monthly series. And of course, I also want to express my gratitude to University of the West, Foguangshan, Shilai Temple, and of course, the Rain. And thank you to all of you. Uh, but before we end, as usually, two more announcements. The next lecture in our series will take place not in um, March, but April, early April, due to scheduling difficulties. Um, it will be April 7, also at 6 p.m. The lecture will be held by Dr. Wei Zheng from Foguang University, our sister university in Taiwan. And the title of her talk is Migration, Mahayana, and Buddhist Mobility, Vietnamese Buddhism in Taiwan. And furthermore, another exciting announcement. Uh, we have another lecture, which is not part of the series, uh, but in collaboration with the Religious Studies Department here and the Chaplaincy Department. We will have Anne Glake here and Amy Langenberg, and they will talk about their new book on sexual abuse in American Buddhism. The, um, it will take part also on Monday at 6 p.m. It will all be our first hybrid um, talk. So for those of you who are in LA, I mean, there's very limited space because we still have COVID. So basically for our students, you are invited to come um, to take part in the lecture in person. And for everybody else, it will also be on Zoom. And you find the information, the registration, everything on our website. So thank you so much, everybody, for attending. And have a great day, great <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye-bye.